Good evening. Uh, welcome to the uh, special meeting of the Urban Renewal Agency for the City of Salem as well as the City Council meeting. Uh, call the uh, Urban Renewal Agency of the City of Salem to order. Uh, if the recorder would call a roll. Board Member Bennett. Here. Board Member Tesler. Absent. Board Member Nanke. Here. Board Member Clausen. Here. Board Member Dickey. Here. Board Member Thomas. Here. Board Member Cannon is absent. In his place, we have guest board member Linda Haglund. Board Member Clem. And, and Chair, you'll, Chair oh. Peterson is absent. Okay. Thank you very much. If you'll join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Well, first I want to welcome uh, guest board member Haglin and uh, uh, to both the uh, Urban Renewal Agency Board as well as to the City Council. Uh, I'm sure you've been told you're more than welcome to participate completely, asking questions, uh, anything you like, except vote. So have a good evening. If you have any, be sure to let me know you have anything you'd like to say. Okay. Hi, I'm Dan. Um, Councilor Mankey. Hey, I'm ready. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I would move approval of the special meeting agenda for the Urban Renewal Agency of the City of Salem for February 28, 2011. All Second. those in Seconded by Second. Dickey. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, agenda's approved. Uh, we have no one uh, signed up for public comment. Is there anyone who Anyone want to comment on anything on the urban renewal agenda? All right. Councilor Nanke, do you want to move these as uh, consent? Again, if no one has any concerns, I'll go ahead and move the action items as a calendar. Second. Second by Dickey. All those in favor of the consent agenda say aye. 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 All opposed? Okay, the Senate agenda is passed, and we are... Now we need to actually approve the calendar. Calendar. Okay. So I would move the uh, consent calendar. Okay, all... Dickie, you want to second that again? Okay. <laughs> all those in favor of the consent agenda, items on the consent agenda, say aye. 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 All opposed? Okay. The consent agenda is passed, and the Urban Renewal Agency is adjourned. And we're well on our way. <laughs> Call to order the Salem City Council meeting for February 28th. Recorder, please call the roll. Councillor Bennett. Here. Councillor Tesler is absent. Councillor Nanke. Here. Councillor Clausen. Here. Councillor Dickey. Here. Councillor Thomas. Here. Councillor Cannon is absent. In his place, we have guest councillor Linda Hagland. Councillor Clem. Here. And Mayor Taylor is up. I'm sorry, Mayor Peterson is absent. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> Deja vu, huh? Okay. We have a couple of proclamations. Is this on? Yeah. Yep. Okay. We have a couple of proclamations this evening. Uh, first, uh, this is the 35th anniversary of the Grant Neighborhood Association, and we have uh, Grant Neighborhood co-chairs Sam Skiller and Eric Bradfield, as well as we have Board Secretary. Jean wasn't able to make it, but Chris and Lola Hackett are here. Ah, well, Chris and Lola, why don't you join us? Well, I'm just really pleased. This is one of my neighborhoods in Ward 1, uh, and one of the most enjoyable neighborhoods uh, I have to attend. Uh, it's a very uh, busy and uh, active neighborhood association with really outstanding leadership reflected here. Uh, I would uh, like to 
just kind of read from the proclamation and give you all a chance to say what you'd like to. Uh, whereas the people of Salem, Oregon recognize the unique and significant differences in the various parts of our city, and whereas the members of the Salem City Council recognize the importance of good communication with all its citizens, and whereas the members of the Salem City Council recognize the importance and understand that neighbors working together is an effective and healthy influence on the quality of life in our community, and whereas the Grant Neighborhood Association was recognized by the Salem City Council <laughs> in 1976 as a Salem Neighborhood Association, and whereas the Grant Neighborhood Association has been a strong advocate for preservation of historic buildings and neighborhood revitalization, and whereas the Grant Neighborhood Association has contributed to the formation and implementation of the North Downtown Plan, the success of which uh, not only brings new life to the Grant Highland District, but also serves as a model and inspiration for the other parts of town. Uh, now, therefore, I, Chuck Bennett, in behalf of Anna Peterson, Mayor of the City of Salem, do hereby proclaim 2000, 2011 as Grant Neighborhood Association's 35th anniversary. So congratulations, that's just great. Thank you, Councillor Bennett. And uh, it's great to have four of our 15 board members here tonight. And uh, we have our meeting this Thursday. If anybody wants to come see what a fun meeting looks like, come to Grant School at 615 on Thursday. And I better fly the Grant School colors again. Our neighborhood association partners very closely with our local school. And, and there's 19 neighborhood associations in Salem, and they're all great. And uh, we believe ours is the best. But if all 19 believe that they're the best, we end up having the city of Shalom, the healthiest community in Oregon. We want to make sure we honor tonight two of our founding board members who, who were with us for most of the 35 years, Lucille Batten and Lorraine Pullman, both passed away within the last year or so, and we stand on their shoulders, and uh, the things that we're doing today have a lot to do with what they and others were doing so long ago. So thanks for this tribute. We really appreciate it. I'm going to turn it over to my co-chair, Eric Bradfield. And I just would like to say thank you all, and it's, uh, it's been a pleasure to serve. I've been on the board for, what, two years now? And uh, it's just a great group of people. The community is very active. And uh, it's actually looking at the, the website and reading the articles. That's actually what brought us into that neighborhood, is how active the Neighborhood Association is and how much they've accomplished. Chris and Lola have uh, refurbished their historic home in our neighborhood. And uh, they're also leading our effort to look into the possibility of a historic district. So we've got great people in a great neighborhood. And like we say, we believe we're the best, but wherever you all live, you better believe that you're the best. All 19 are great. Go Salem. <laughs> oh, the boundaries of Grant, where we're just north of downtown. So basically D Street on the south, the river on the west, um, Madison Avenue on the north, and the railroad tracks on the west. We're the smallest geographically of the neighborhoods, um, but the mightiest. <laughs> Thank you, Sam, very Thank much, so much, Eric. Lola. And we have one other proclamation, uh, Kiwanis Children's Cancer Cure Month. And we have uh, three Kiwanis Club presidents, Artie Day of West Salem, Bill Van Atta of Downtown Salem Club, Dennis Bierman of Capital Salem Club, and Barbara Chesbrough. And let me let folks know what this is all about. Whereas the men and women of the Pacific Northwest District of Kiwanis International have exhibited a deep sense of pride in the community by serving the needs of families and children worldwide, and whereas the Pacific Northwest District of Kiwanis International has, effective, has effective October 1, 2010, initiated the multi-year district-wide service project, Kiwanis Children's Cancer Cure Program, and whereas this program will fund the Kiwanis Children's Cancer Fellowships, allowing physicians to seek cures for currently untreatable forms of cancer, and whereas the Kiwanis Clubs of the Pacific Northwest will collaborate 
with Dornbecker Children's Hospital in Portland and Seattle Children's Hospital and the Vancouver BC, BC Children's Hospital. And whereas the local Kiwanis clubs are the epitome of their defining statement, Kiwanis is a global organization of volunteers dedicated to changing the world, one child and one community at a time. Now therefore, on behalf of children, we do hereby proclaim February 2011 and 12, Kiwanis Children's Cancer Cure Month throughout the district and encourage uh, members to embrace and celebrate this endeavor in the interest of children suffering can cancer, dated this 28th day, February 2011, Anna M. Peterson, Mayor of Salem. just spent Saturday up at the Dornbecker Children's Hospital and just from the Marion and Polk counties we have over 500 children that are admitted to Dornbecker Children's Hospital and because of that we are making 500 blankets to give each and every child that comes into uh, the hospital from our area and we're also raising a half a million dollars to help Endeavor the um, research um, and our goal is in the next four to five years to get rid of brain cancer in young children so if there's anything you can do to help call a Kiwanian thank you I'm Artie Day uh, president of the West Salem Kiwanis Club uh, we meet every week on Tuesday at noon at the uh, Garibaldi restaurant on Edgewater yeah, my name is Bill Venata, and uh, speaking of the Grant School, our downtown Columbus Club, which meets at the Marco Polo right across the street here, uh, Grant School is one of our schools. We work with Grant School and Richmond School, and uh, so uh, some of our funds this year go to the take care of the kids of those two schools. So here in Grant Association, we're deeply part of that ourselves. And uh, our club has already, I think, between 25 and 30 uh, blankets already. We, our goal is to meet, help meet this 500 blanket goal. And so, uh, if you have little blankets or you can go to places to buy blankets like two ninety nine at uh, Walgreens and uh, drop them off at your local Kiwanis Club, it would help the kids at Dornbeck out a lot. Appreciate it. Well, thank you very much. You bet. Have a great I'd entertain a motion uh, to add under reports of boards, commissions, committees, etc., a sub B historic Deepwood Estate. Uh, Lois Cole, director, uh, will make a presentation to the city council. So moved. Second. S uh, motion by uh, Tesler, second by Clem. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Okay, we'll add a sub B. Okay, reports of boards, commissions, committees, and presentation by outside agencies. First up, Salem Senior Center Advisory Commission Annual Report. Chair Sides, uh, Council Members, I'm Richard McGinty. I am the current acting president of the Salem Center Advisory Commission, now commonly known as the Center 50 Plus, and I'm here to present the 2009-2010 report. Before getting into that, I'd like to introduce some of the other board members that are with us. <coughs> Excuse me. We have Helen Finley, who is a partner with Salem Electric, Mr. John Stensland, who is a commissioner at large, Mr. Terry Pratt, who is a commissioner at large, and we have our executive director, Marilyn Daly, that's with us too. Although the Salem Senior Center 
Center 50 Plus is physically located in Council Member Dickey's ward, I suspect that there are Salem seniors from all of your wards that come to the Salem Senior Center. And from my understanding, all have enjoyed and appreciated quite well. You all should have a copy of the Salem Senior Center um, report, but let me give you a couple highlights from that report. First of all, our mission is to be the primary location to support the socialization, recreation, and nutritional needs of older adults in the Salem area. Although that's quite short, it encompasses a huge amount of activity that goes on in the Salem Senior Center. Salem Senior Center has a very small staff. We have Executive Director Daly, she has a small staff, and it is primarily senior volunteer driven. It is seniors helping seniors. They are supplemented by volunteers, a huge number of volunteers, hundreds of volunteers. It's like hundreds of cats, herding cats. Volunteers provide a great service, but they also provide also need the direction from the professional staff that we have at the Salem Senior Center. The Salem Senior Center has people from ages 50 to 100. On page four of the report, there is a breakdown by age group and gender. The report is presented in four parts. Stability and vitality is the first section. Uh, we essentially, we're discussing finances of the Salem Senior and how it operates. We are chartered with raising 50% of our operating budget. I am pleased to advise you that we have met that goal for 2009-2010. That comes primarily from program fees, fundraising efforts, financial partnerships, and friends of the Salem Senior Center. One of the fundraisers that we had in the 2009-2010 calendar year was the presentation by Dr. Maya Angelou, which was, to me, in my mind, one of the highlights of the Salem city for the calendar year. What a, what a great thing to have someone like Dr. Angelou come. We have partnerships with the Salem Senior Center. The uh, Friends of the Salem Senior Center is our fund, nonprofit fundraising organization in the uh, calendar, in, excuse me, in the fiscal, in the, the year at issue. Uh, we went from 335 members to 875 members. I think that is an indication of how well the new senior center has been received. In the collaboration section, section two of the report, our community partners, they're always changing because the needs of the seniors in our area change. Uh, some but not all that are highlighted in the report are Chemeketa Community, Community College, Salem Kaiser Meals on Wheels, the Alzheimer's Network of Oregon, and Salem Electric, and I earlier introduced Ms. Finley on that. As far as the programming section, section three of the report, there are over 200 programs and services highlighted, uh, 200, over 200 programs and services, two are highlighted, Friends Respite Program and 50 Plus Health Center. Uh, the fourth area was citizen leadership. We had volunteers in 2009 of 607, which represented 76,000 hours of service and a one and a half million dollar one and a half million dollar dollar value, if one can put a dollar value on volunteers. We're very happy with our brand new facility. It's a 30,000 foot facility, which is about a 50% increase in the size from the prior location, which allows us now to have a commercial kitchen. There is a bistro, cafe 50 plus, a fitness center, health and counseling offices, along with all of the offices that were there previously. I see my time is up. If you'll indulge me for two quick points that you won't find in the uh, report. One is we are very happy for the leadership provided by Executive Director Daly and we are very happy for the support that the mayor's past and presence and the Salem City Council has provided to our our facility and your facility. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. That was really an excellent report. Uh, any questions? No? Thank you very much. Thank you. and the historic Deepwood Estate.
Lois? Thank you, council members, for inviting me here to tell you a little bit about Deepwood. Uh, this is really information for information purposes only. I did bring, home, bring a little takeaway for you to take with you, give you something to look at while I'm talking. Um, last year was a pretty historic year in terms of revenues decreasing for TOT and lots of competition and I expect that we're going to have the same situation in this coming year. So I just wanted to provide you some information on historic Deepwood Estate. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, I know just by my experience in Salem for years that there are people here that haven't even been to Deepwood even though it's only about five blocks away from here. So um, what I wanted to share with you is what I consider the most important piece of uh, Deepwood is its significance to the Salem community. First of all, it's architecturally significant. It's designed by Oregon's first state architect, William Christmas Knighton, who designed the Governor Hotel, the Supreme Court Building, and Deepwood. It is, um, it's got historically significant gardens, which were designed by the team of Elizabeth Lord and Edith Scriver in 1929. It's the only public garden that they've created, and they are considered one of Northwest, the Northwest's premier garden architects. Um, the home was built at a cost of $10,000 when other homes were being built for 1000 So it really is Salem's most opulent remaining home, if you think of the difference of a million dollar versus a $10 million. Even now, that's significant. It's socially significant in Salem's history, and for me personally, that's the most important point of it, or one of the most important points. It was going to be torn down um, for an IBM building, so we wouldn't see any of that now if that had happened. And instead of that happening, a group of Salem citizens got together and uh, went to the city, and the city purchased that building. And that is important because grassroots efforts are very uh, few and far in between at this time, and I think that's a takeaway that I'd like council members to uh, Keep in mind, the city owns the property and it's managed by the Friends of Deepwood. And how that relationship works is that the city is responsible for the grounds, they're responsible for the exterior of the building, and other than that, basically the Friends of Deepwood is responsible for raising all of the money that it takes to maintain the interior of the house, maintain that beautiful woodwork um, in the past few months. We recently remodeled the Deepwood Kitchen, taking it to 1950s, and I hope you'll get a chance to see it. We've replaced the carpeting in the first floor of the house with a historic wool. We've replaced uh, many pieces in the solarium. We have now have the property lit up at night, and it really is a um, credit to the council and to the citizens of Salem that this property is as well maintained as it is. Um, we have some goals coming up, one of which is to possibly create an interpretive center in, uh, on the Deepwood grounds, possibly in the carriage house that would allow Lord and Scriver Gardens to partner with the Friends of Deepwood and provide a very, very special place for people to visit. Um, last year, over 18,000 people came to the house and gardens. It's been written up in magazines, in Sunset, considered best of the West, one of the oldest standing carriage houses in the Northwest. And um, it is a significant piece of property, but very different than other properties that are also tot funded. We are a lot smaller in our grounds. We have a smaller museum. And so when you think about these properties, just know that you're not comparing apples with apples. Each of them are different. and. Um, I hope you will all come and visit us soon. I have room for any questions if you'd like. Any questions? What are your hours? Our hours uh, coming up, they're going to be every day but uh, Tuesday. And the gardens open? The gardens are open daily, dawn to dusk. Right.
every day, 365 days a year. Deepwood's kitty corner from my office, so I get to see it each day and really well, enjoy good. it. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you. All right. Uh, it's time uh, for public comment on agenda items other than public hearings and deliberations. I have two people signed up. Uh, Mark Shipman. Good evening, Mr. Chair and members of the Council. Um, I am Mark Shipman. I'm an attorney with Sawfield Griggs here in Salem, representing the Salem Kaiser School District this evening. Uh, I'm here uh, speaking on behalf of item 4.3F, and our request this evening is uh, for you to approve uh, for the Salem Kaiser School District uh, the ability for us to connect to city services, specifically sewer and water um, outside of the city. Our request, um, we have submitted a, uh, our annexation application to the city on November 10th. Uh, so that's already in and it's, it's uh, been approved, it's pending. It is early because we're going to be looking for the annexation ballot in uh, 2012, actually. Um, so that's in. Uh, second, the Salem Revised Code allows us to file. Uh, and the Salem Revised Code also allows you to approve such a request. Um, city sewer and water lines are located across Walker Road to the west. And if you look at your packet that we submitted um, and that was included in the staff report, there's a map that shows the 10 acre property that, uh, that the Salem Kaiser School District owns. And to the, uh, to the west or, or to the left of that is a, is a dark uh, kind of thick shaded line. That ha actually is the city limits for the city of Salem. So we're just outside of the city limits. City limits actually would abut our westerly property line. Uh, the district will be paying for the cost of the extensions of these facilities and will be paying a connection fee for the city of, to the city of Salem uh, for these extensions. And really this is a timing issue for us. Um, some of you may or may not know, but back in 2009, we actually had filed previously for an annexation request uh, for this property and also to the property to the north and south of this. And we had expected that we would have been approved in 2010 and actually should have been one of those uh, annexations that are uh, presently being considered in your ordinance under, under uh, section 9.2 uh, 9 this evening. We should have been there along with them. However, uh, the attorney uh, representing the property owner at the time actually revoked uh, it, their consent. And so that killed our ability to annex the property. So what we did is we went back to the drawing board and we resubmitted our annexation request just for the 10 acres. Um, the district's committed to building uh, this school and opening it in the fall of 2012. We've committed that to our patrons. And to that end, we intend to be pulling uh, building permits here this spring. Uh, and to be able to start construction this spring and this summer. Um, so uh, shortly afterwards, the school opening in 2012, we should be annexed about, about the same time now, in, but in 2012. Uh, we agree with your staff. This is a good request, and I would respectfully request that you approve agenda item 4.3F. Uh, and thank you for your consideration. I'd be happy to answer any questions if there are any. Yes, Councillor Dickey. Thank you for coming down. That um, helps to that, to clarify some things. Um, look, I'm looking at the map now where it kind of outlines the property, and I just want to be clear. Does the school district own the property immediately to the north and to the south of what is outlined here? I mean, did they own some property prior to that, or is it? Do, does the school district only own that one parcel, 10-acre parcel? The school district will only own that 10-acre par parcel right in the middle. Okay, and do you know what is to the north and south? Is it just bare land, or it it is uh, it is vacant land uh, to the north. It's it's currently being farmed by the by the owner. Um, that owner will still own the property to the north and to the south. To the south, they have their primary residence also located on that property. Okay, thank you. Any further questions? Great. Thank you, Mr. Shipman. Thank you. Uh, next, uh, Rich Harcourt. Uh, thank you, Council President uh, Bennett and uh, members of the Council. I'm Rich Harcourt, and I'm here in my capacity as the uh, chair of the Salem Public Art Commission, and uh, particularly in support of uh, item uh, 9-1-A on your calendar, 
which uh, has staff recommendation that the City Council advance Ordinance Bill 13-11 uh, to second reading for uh, enactment. Uh, very briefly, uh, I am not a lawyer, but I think I can answer the two parts of this and certainly would be pleased if uh, uh, the City Attorney and uh, Deputy City Manager Sean O'Day would uh, pipe in if you think I'm off color or off remarks. But what it is right now, simply a Scrivener issue number one, the, it is the Public Art Commission, the Salem Public Art Commission, and there's reference in the ordinance to Arts Commission. So we want to be sure that all of that is uh, in compliance. Secondly, the, uh, as it was read by the city attorney, the ordinance as it stands now uh, allows the Public Art Commission to have the responsibility for the aid, maintenance, uh, care, and feeding of the Salem's art collection from the adoption of the ordinance. But what we are talking about here is amending it in such a way so as to assure that it refers to all pieces in the city's art collection. As you know, the city's collection started in the late 1960s, early 70s. There are over 135 pieces. And so by a little niggle and jiggle, we need to assure that that responsibility falls within that purview. So uh, that's it in a nutshell. If I may, may bring up one other point, because I know Councillor Tesler has asked about this, and you have, Councillor Bennett, about the uh, current plans for the Salem Peace Mural proposal that's, uh, pr that, be, that uh, is in the planning stages now. And I can uh, let you know that a public hearing has been set for Thursday, March 10, at 4.30 p.m. in the City Manager's Council's office uh, to uh, be able to uh, uh, discuss this thoroughly. So we encourage all of you to come on board. It met the 30-day requirement, and it's our first public hearing as the uh, Salem Public Art Commission. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Any questions? Good. Great. Thank, Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to just take a moment of personal privilege to uh, recognize uh, Representative Kevin Cameron, who is the Republican leader of the Oregon House of Representatives. Ke Kevin, did you have any? Just want to say Just hi. Just want to say hi. Okay. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Okay. Councillor Nagy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I would move the consent calendar with additions and with the following polls. 4.3D by Councillor Tesler, 4.3F by Councillor Dickey, 4.3G by Councillor Tesler, and 4.3I by Councillor Namke. by Councillor Nanke, seconded by Councillor Dickey. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. 4.3D. Or do we move the no, that's piece by piece? No, now we'll just take each of the, uh, the pulled each. items in order. Pulled okay. 4.3D, Councillor Tesler. Thank you, <laughs> Mayor, Representative whatever you are tonight, pro tem, Bennett. Just make your motion, Tesler. I'll move staff recommendation. Second. Second by Nanke. Any discussion? Yes. Um, this, I, I would like to say that I really totally support this um, item. And the reason, the whole reason why I pulled it is that I would really like the officer or whoever is knowledgeable to explain some questions that I have at the podium, especially concerning how these pedestrian crossings work and how they will be enforced downtown. Um, when walking downtown, I see a lot of people um, entering into the white lines, which is now illegal, and you can get a very large ticket for doing that. And so I think this is a good way to educate people and talk about um, where your rig should be when people are crossing the street. Um, so I just wondered if 
I uh, see Mr. Engelmeyer head drifting down towards the podium, so that's great. Um, I would like to do that. And then I'd also like to say that as a pedestrian or a bicyclist, which I am both, it is our responsibility to dress to be seen at night. It is very, very dangerous to not wear reflective clothing or carry a light or have something light colored on. Several times I've almost hit people driving around Salem at night. It's very dangerous to not make yourself seen. Please take responsibility for yourself and wear reflective clothing or at least carry a flashlight in your hand or wear a white shirt or a jacket. Um, very dangerous. We've had a rash of pedestrian deaths in Oregon. Uh, we're gonna, you know, really reduce those deaths and not have people getting killed while they're trying to ride their bike or walk around the city. Thank you. Uh, I'm Lieutenant Jim Engelmeyer with the Police Department. I oversee our traffic control unit. Unfortunately, those folks are out working or not available tonight, so I'm going to step in. I did work traffic for about six years, so I'm real familiar with this. Uh, this pedestrian grant is one that we have had. It would be just an ongoing grant. And one thing we have found by doing these pedestrian type grants is the safety aspect of it. There is a media blitz which we go out and explain through different sources of media, whether that be radio, uh, the newspaper, uh, how we can get that information out to folks. Uh, this grant would be used outside of their normal duty hours, so they would adjust their regular duty time and then they would work the grant on actually grant hours. When they do the grants, uh, an inve pedestrian enforcement is they will publicize it on the radio, in the media, so people know that it's coming up. They actually put signs out, so if you're driving, you're going to see that coming into the area. And then there's going to be a crosswalk with an officer that's going to come out and see if that vehicle will yield to them. If they don't, another officer, usually on a, a motorcycle, is going to stop them, talk to them, and very likely end up with a citation. Uh, as far as the downtown area, yes, uh, the crosswalks are a safety zone and they are recognized under the ORS traffic uh, statutes. If a person pulls into that safety zone, goes over that white line with the front of their vehicle, all of their vehicle, any part of it, it is a traffic violation and can be cited for that. Uh, we've been working with our downtown uh, bike unit and also the traffic unit. They are going to be focusing on those types of violations. Uh, we are really concerned with the safety aspect for our pedestrians and our bicycles and the vehicles all in a small area on the roadway because no matter who's right or wrong, it's going to be the pedestrian or the bicycle that's probably going to get hurt after getting hit by a 4,000 pound plus vehicle. Uh, in 2010, we did have two uh, pedestrian fatalities involved with vehicle accidents. So there is an emphasis on this to continue this and be ongoing throughout all parts of the year. And as Councilor Tester uh, commented, one of our big problems is at night is people are wearing dark clothing. So it's not reflective, it's not even contrasting. If I walk out in just a dark suit, uh, even a dark uniform, and there's not a lot of street lights out there, a lot of times people don't see you, especially if there's other lights that attract uh, their attention to them or if something's going on up ahead. If there's a traffic stop and the red and blue lights are going on, people tend to focus on that and they don't see people crossing the street. So we are going to be working on all of these traffic safety issues, but we are going to be focusing on the downtown area especially because we know that is a problem. Conversely, we also work with pedestrians and bicyclists. They need to be doing their share of being safe out on the road. Pedestrians need to be using crosswalks and obey the pedestrian crosswalk signals because a lot of times they get in a hurry, they run across there, next thing somebody comes across in a vehicle, total in their right of way, and there's an accident. And like I said, pedestrian gets hit by a car or truck, uh, pedestrian's going to get hurt. So we're looking at those aspects there. Uh, we're also looking at uh, working with our bicyclists because we have a lot of bicycle problems. Um, sometimes they feel that they don't get their share of the road and we need to educate them also that they, need, they are considered a vehicle when they're on the roadway, just like a car, truck, or anything like that. They need to abide by the same rules that a driver would. So when you have one-way traffic and a bike's coming the opposite way, that can cause problems because all of a sudden they jut out in front of you. You may swerve to your left or your right. Next thing you know, you bump into a car next to you. So we're working on all these issues, and uh, we'll be addressing that through uh, enhanced focus efforts on that. Thank you. I really appreciate you uh, giving us that overview. Um, I'm a frequent bicyclist and commuter, and I really appreciate um, you know people looking out for my safety because I, if someone hits me with a 5,000-pound rig, I don't really have a choice. But I do have a headlight on my bike, and I do wear reflective clothing, and so I do make the choices to make myself seen. Um, but anything, we did have a person who was killed 
out on Lancaster Street just recently. That was very sad. That person was a Cessna resident. Um, if we can prevent one death, then it's worth it. Yes, that's the main focus of our traffic unit is increasing vehicle and traffic safety citywide. So we'll continue with efforts like these and uh, keep working on problem areas. So thank you. Great. Thank you. Councilor Nanke. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, on my way here tonight, <coughs> almost two people, um, commercial in Madrona, a pedestrian coming behind cars, not even across the crosswalk mm -hmm. as I made the right, and then again at Ratcliffe right across from the old Safeway, someone standing right in the middle of the road. I didn't even see them until they were outside of my window. Dark clothes, um, rather scary. So yes, make sure that people can see you if you're crossing. You can cross anywhere. It's not illegal to cross outside of a crosswalk. Um, but make it to where I can see you as well. Question on the uh, officer in the crosswalk that steps out when you're doing the, uh, the targeted um, events. Are they dressed in a police uniform or are they dressed in civilian clothes? Because I believe be it or not, they've done it both ways. Stop uh, it! Sometimes police officer just in, you know, out in the road. kind of street civilian type clothing. Usually, that's what they do. And when they set this up, it is set up so that the driver sees them with ample time. They will actually go out and figure out how fast, you know, the, what the speed limit is for that section of the roadway, how fast a vehicle uh, can perceive it, should be able to react and stop safely, and then they back that up so that when that officer is going to step out in the crosswalk, you know, if the driver's looking down the road and watching the roadway and the crosswalks, there should be no reason they shouldn't have seen this person. So it's not like they step out and try to cause an issue. This has given them a lot of notice, but we have people, uh, especially Liberty up around the Highland area, uh, they'll cross out in a crosswalk. They'll actually get out into the middle of the road and somebody slows for one and somebody else comes flying by at 30, 40, 45 miles an hour. And once you get over 30 miles per hour, uh, that's pretty much the threshold for where a person gets hit by a vehicle is probably going to be a fatality. Uh, and if it's around 30, there's going to be serious life-changing type injuries is what's expected there. So they are out there trying to set these up so people are aware of it and they're uh, driving and paying attention and not being distracted. Thanks. Any further questions, comments? Okay. Uh, all those in favor of Councillor Councillor Tesler's motion to adopt the uh, staff report, say aye. 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 All opposed. Okay. 4.3D is approved. 4.3F, Councillor Dickey, you pull this. Sure. Um. I'm going to move staff recommendation because I have some questions. Uh, second. second. Thank you. Seconded by Tesla. Yeah, I, I actually have several questions about this. Um, I for, guess this for um, Public Works Director Fernandez. Um, I sent most of them to you, thought of a few after that, but. Um, First of all, I guess what I want to know is, um, you know, we're asking to bring a water sewer connection to a property that is not yet annexed. This is the first time I recall this since I've been on council. Is this a very common thing? Are you, has it happened before? Yes, Councilor Peter Fernandez, Public Works Director. It hasn't happened as much recently uh, because uh, prior to your coming on council, uh, council adopted a policy that, uh, that we wouldn't do that. So we talked about that in the staff report, and the reason we talked about it is because legally it's acceptable, the code allows it, uh, but uh, uh, you know, a prior council had established a policy whereby uh, we did not want to provide water and sewer for properties that are outside of the city limits. Uh, prior to that time, yeah, we did it uh, uh, several times. That's why we have a lot of properties developed outside of the, uh, outside of the city limits. Uh, as Mr. Shipman pointed out, uh, the water and sewer is right there. It's right across the, it's right on uh, the street, in fact. So, so bringing the service to the site is not an issue, but, but it is new to this council. Yes. Uh, um, yeah. And then I guess my next question is, should the, in the unlikely event that this property not be annexed, the voters don't choose to have it annexed, are we on the hook for anything? Are we, is the city any more liability? Uh, no, no, not at all. They would simply continue to be a, uh, uh, a customer of the city of Salem water and sewer utility and uh, the city would have uh, no other liabilities. 
Councillor Clausen. Uh, so first off, <clears throat> I should declare a potential conflict of interest since I work for the school district and facilities. However, unless anybody has any issues, I feel like I can vote on this and discuss it. Um, so that out of the way, uh, Mr. Fernandez, the uh, following up on Councillor Dickey's question, if it doesn't pass, if it weren't to pass, could you talk through the non-remonstrance agreement that we put on these types of ideas and tell us how that works. If it doesn't pass, do they have to go back again until it does pass or how does that work? Because I want to make sure we're not contributing to a problem of annexing out to our urban growth boundary, which is once our, one of our council goals. Certainly. The, uh, uh, what we typically ask uh, in situations such as this is that the property owner uh, sign a non-remonstrance agreement where basically they'll, they'll agree to annex. They won't fight the annexation process. Uh, in this case, the district had applied for annexation, so they're more than willing uh, to do that, they'll be ready to to resubmit their applications for the for the November 2012 uh, election, uh, which is the next the next general election. So uh, yeah, if if uh, and it it is very unlikely that it would fail. Uh, the history of annexations in uh, uh, in uh, Salem is that there's only been one denial in 150 cases that have Close gone to, to the yes. to the voters and that was a special election in a special circumstance so it's highly unlikely that this one wouldn't pass if it didn't pass yeah we would uh, uh, have them reapply uh, so that uh, it would go to the voters again in 2014 uh, mrs. woods just handed me a note says that what we do uh, what we typically do is we uh, we require them to apply, not a, not just a re, uh, uh, non remonstrance but we actually uh, require application to annex. So they would have to resubmit their application for, for annexation. Councilor Nick. Thank you. Also wanted to declare a potential conflict of interest. My wife worked for Salem Kaiser School District in the facilities department, <laughs> and I feel like I'm being unbiased and participated in this. Uh, I do. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Dick. I have another question. If, um, if for some reason we chose not to allow this, I, and I should have asked Mr. Shipman this, what's their timeline in terms of, you know, they would reapply, they, would they just wait until the election in 2012 and then you right. know, hopefully be annexed and then come back to us in it, a year? Right, it would delay them. They are, uh, uh, they're on a schedule to have that school opened in September of 2012. Uh, so the election would come two months later. Uh, if council chose not to provide them with water and sewer, then yeah, they'd be in a situation where they really wouldn't be able uh, to start construction uh, till after November 2012 because you need water at some point for construction. So therefore, they probably wouldn't open until 2013 or 2014. So it put them two years out of their out of their uh, schedule. Uh, Mr. Fernandez, I just wanted to note that you uh, revised the recommendation that we received uh, uh, to make a condition of the, do you want to explain of the water sewer line that it be to an element? Certainly, Councillor Bennett. Uh, the, we had some discussions as we, uh, I got a couple of emails this morning from uh, from councillors and, uh, and by the way, I sent a, an S Council <laughs> email on this issue that I guess never got to anyone except for Councillor Clem who I attached to another email and I apologize for that. We, we had some additional explanations for you that I guess never never arrived uh, but we had some discussions at pre-council about you know some what-if scenarios and one of the things that we wanted to just solidify a, uh, a little more is that the water and sewer is really just for construction of this elementary school and not for any other purpose and that's why we redid the staff report and just added that to the recommendation so that it tracked a little better uh, to the issue statement as well uh, just as an aside because they are acquiring the property through eminent domain the district really couldn't use it for anything other than this elementary school. So so I think we're we have built in suspenders here on, on this water sewer issue. Double whammy on it. Yeah. <laughs> Any further questions, comments? Councillor yes. Dick. Thank you. Um, I I feel better about this now that you've explained it a little bit more. Um, I I will support this, but you know I do have some concerns about doing this to a non-annexed property. Um, even just recently, you know, I've had issues in my neighborhood with 
recent, fairly new developed property that um, is in the county because for some reason it wasn't annexed before it was developed and the issues there are affecting our city residents. Um, I've got graffiti in my neighborhood that affects the city residents that the county does not have the resources to deal with in a timely manner the same way the city would. So um, I, I have a little bit of a little bit of heartburn over this, I'll support it, but um, definitely it's only because I feel pretty confident that if for some reason it goes down, they will come back to be annexed and that they've agreed to do that. Councillor Clapp. Thank you, uh, Councillor Bennett. Uh, Peter, uh, it, with uh, the routine of, and maybe Vicki could answer this, with um, the elections, annexation elections, when would this property, when would the voters vote on it, and when would it be annexed into the city if they approved it? The vote would be in November of 2012, and it would probably be about this time of year in 2013. Okay, in two years from now, then. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Further questions, comments? The uh, motion on the table is to accept the staff recommendation. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? passes. Councillor Tesler, 4.3G. Thank you. I'd like to uh, have a substitute motion and I move that council support Senate Bill 536 if it passes the Oregon Senate. Second. Second by Dickey. The, the effect of your motion, Councilor Tesler, is that the, that's the only thing that the council would be approving. Because you made a substitute motion. Okay, I'll make a substitute motion. I'll move that we uh, support the entire report as stated with the exception of changing the vote to support Senate Bill 536 if it passes the Oregon Senate. Second. Second by Dickey. Councilor, you want to comment? Yes, I would. Thank you. You know, plastic bags are a real problem. Um, they're a problem. They're not just a problem to public works. They're, mm. they're, and public works has stated that they don't see any foreseeable effects from plastic bags. But plastic bags are a problem all over the city. Um, I'd like a counselor here to tell me that they have not seen a plastic bag as a piece of trash blowing around in their ward. I don't think that anybody here could tell me that. And I also think that plastic bags are a global problem. They're not just a problem in Oregon. They're not just a problem in Salem. They're a problem all over the world. And I'll quote an example to you. Um, I went scuba diving in Bonaire, which is an island in the... Um, Dutch Antilles, it's off the coast of Venezuela, and it's known as a scuba diving um, destination. It has mo some of the most pristine reefs in the Caribbean. And uh, while we were diving there, uh, we saw a dead sea turtle that had eaten a plastic bag because sea turtles think that they're jellyfish under the water, and so they eat these plastic bags and it kills them, and sea turtles are endangered. So, you know, after seeing that for myself and then after doing some more scuba diving in other places, including the Northwest, Canada, Florida, and other places in the Caribbean, I can tell you that I always see these bags and I see them down on the bottom stuck to the reefs. So they are a problem. Um, we see them in the creeks. We see them in our pickups. I also have a fact from you from the Ocean Conservancy. Um, according, a half million volunteers participated in worldwide cleanup, covered 108 countries, 45 states. All told, volunteers reported some 10,240,000 pieces of debris, of which 1.2 million pieces were plastic bags, roughly 11%. If you extract those statistics for Oregon, the group found that 6,881 pieces of debris collected in the state, 890 bits, or plastic bags. That's about 13% of the total. That's a lot of trash from plastic bags. Um, I also have been told that these plastic bags get into the what they call the mill facility, which is the sorting facility at the recycling centers, and they can get them into the machinery. And when these bags get in the machinery, they make the machinery grind to a halt, which is a huge problem for the people who run these mills. And Mary Kance is here tonight um, to back that up for me. Um, you know, this is not a perfect bill. 
what bill is, but it is a start to addressing the problem of these plastic bags being trash in our environment. They are very difficult to recycle. You cannot put them in your mixed recycling. You have to take them somewhere. Not everyone recycles them. I'm not sure if they get recycled when you take them to those places. And so I'm going to ask for your support on this tonight. And I want to make sure that I, I clarify what I'm asking you for. What I'm asking you for is your support if this passes the Senate. If it doesn't pass the Senate, it is what it is. We don't support it. But if it does pass, I think we should support it. I think we should support it. And I think it's a good thing. And that's all I have to say. Councilor Nanky. Mm -hmm. An interesting issue. Um, yes, plastic bags can create a lizard, or lizard, uh, a litter hazard. Um, it's a lazard. <laughs> that being said, um, the whole bill to me is a new fee or a tax. Because right now, I can choose paper or plastic. This would basically take away my choice to choose plastic and then charge me a nickel for every paper bag I use. Um, so if they were separated out to some extent, I may or may not, there's still a lot of other information that plastic bags are actually made of a waste byproduct that had very little use elsewhere. Um, so it's actually using something that normally would have just been, you know, flared off the end of a burn stack. Um, so in that respect, it is using something rather than wasting something. Um, Yes, I see plastic bags on the side of the street. I also see more, more than any plastic bags I see, I see McDonald's bags thrown out of people's cars. So it's paper bags with cups. Um, that's the one that I really just drives me crazy um, and would love to find them as they pulled out and, and jump out in front and see if they stop for me in a crosswalk um, so that I could tell them to go back and pick it up. Um, but th with that being said, um, if it passes the Senate, I still have a problem with the, uh, the nickel bag. On, so I can't support the motion. Councilor Clausen. Um, I definitely do see plastic bags around, but I, I think that I feel, I feel this isn't a position the city needs to get into. Uh, we had some conversations in the legislative committee about the impacts that this has on the city as a whole and it really doesn't have any impact my understanding is it doesn't have any impact on our function as the city and uh, as far as the litter goes I understand that but I think the imperfection of the five cents is got me I'd vote no on this one and reason being is uh, I'd say the vast majority of people don't use a reusable bag that they bring themselves and so if you take away the convenience of a plastic bag which is the most widely used, you're adding insult to injury by taking away the convenient and then charging them for the second best convenience. So, I don't know, it's something I can't support right now. I think it's something the city probably doesn't need to jump in the fray on. Councilor Tesler. Thank you. I, I do appreciate those comments. I would um, like to remind Councilor Nakey and Councilor Clausen that I'm sure a lot of people felt that way about the bottle bill when the bottle bill was first passed. And if you look at what a difference the bottle bill has made in trash, and also in what is left in our environment. Um, I think you would agree that the bottle bill has been a positive thing over time. And I'm sure people felt the same way about the bottle bill, taking their convenience away. I would also beg to differ that I do see quite a few people using um, fabric bags at the grocery store. And also I see people using mesh bags um, for their uh, vegetables so they don't have to use a plastic bag. So I think that raising consciousness is always a good thing and when you can buy a bag for a dollar and use it in the store you know I, I just we have to take some positive steps forward and you know no they don't affect the city's operation and they don't get stuck in the wastewater intake they don't get stuck up in the snow plow they don't affect our equipment but you know what they affect our city they affect our city. And when you walk around downtown and you see a bunch of plastic bags blowing around or floating in the river or in the creek or wherever, that affects all of us. So I continue to see it as a global issue. Um, I just think that, you know, as, as part of getting trash off the streets, I appreciate Councillor Nanke's comments about the paper bags. I would like to say that paper, 
paper bags from McDonald's and the cups are biodegradable. Um, those things will rot away in time. A plastic bag will not. I'm sorry I don't have the half-life of a plastic bag, but I'm pretty sure it's a long time in a landfill. So, thank you. Councillor Dickey. Thank you. Um, I do support this because I, I guess I do see that it does affect our, it doesn't affect the, maybe the operations of our city, but um, it will affect our retailers. Whether, you know, whatever side you're on it, it does, ha it will have an effect um, if it goes through. And I do happen to support it. Um, I owned a car at one time that a plastic bag got sucked up into the engine and caused all sorts of problems. One that just had been blowing around the side of the road and um, I had no control over it getting sucked up into the engine. So um, there are there are issues with this, and it does affect the livability in our city. So I think um, I think it's a positive step forward, and I would be surprised even if it does pass that there aren't some revisions down the road that um, will make it a little more usable for everyone. That seems to be the way with these kinds of bills. Councilor Nagy. Yeah, just one other quick point uh, in regards to the actual title. They're not single-use bags. I reuse those bags at home, at least the ones that they haven't cut the bottom of the entire stack of them, which they do so that I have to buy garbage bags. Um, I sort through and, and flip all of them up, and you can always see the cut in the same place. Sometimes they miss. So those <coughs> get to reuse again, and I recycle every single bag. If we want to talk about the bottle bill, then charge me a penny for every plastic bag and let me turn it back in. Um, which I think they would scream over because they scream over having to count bottles right now. Um, so the bottle bill didn't say you can't have cups or cans or bottles anymore. It basically made them valuable to people to turn back in, not take away somebody's right to actually use them to begin with. Further questions, Councillor Tesler? I, I just wanted one clarification, if I could. Your uh, your motion is very specific. So, if the bill is amended in any way uh, that perhaps exempts certain plastic bags or anything, you want us to continue to support the bill. I, there's a you're you know you're on an avenue that could end up uh, supporting a bill you may not favor and that's what I because they do get amended all you have referenced is a bill number at this point I'll accept a friendly amendment from you well I'm not sure how to fix it because of the vagaries of the legislative system so I, I probably leave it to you but I, I just want to alert you to the problem that may exist there and what you're asking the council to endorse which might be a bill that does something quite different than, than what you're asking for. That's, that is probably my biggest trepidation right now, is that this could be talking about something entirely different when it leaves the Senate. Do you see, see the problem? Mm -hmm. Councilor Clem. Mr. Chair, just a thought. We've been through this in previous legislative sessions that we ask staff to do, a, 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 we can declare a position and then ask staff to bring back if the bill's amended in any way for reconsideration later. So not, not yeah. I, I, any one of these bills will be amended next week, Chuck. So okay. I, I, I think if we just ask, if we take a position, we would ask staff on any bill to uh, keep us apprised of amendments that are either pending or voted on. Okay. Yeah, no, did the, uh, the motion actually include a uh, numerical designator with the support then and what was that it didn't. because if it were one that means a counselor or the mayor would actually go testify on it two would be staff three would so then what do we do with it sorry I didn't address the chair I'm sorry no I was listening I was no it's just support nobody goes Nobody testifies that from uh, uh, the city officially under under the motion as as we're understanding it right now. If, if I may, then what are we actually doing? Can I look at your agenda? Really? If we're not going to submit that yes. to anyone It'll or do anything time, about it, believe it or not. Well, I think so what the councilor is asking for. Let me just try to is that if if the Senate bill and it's generally its present form were to advance through the Senate and be headed toward the House, 
I assume you would want the council to take another run at it and take some sort of, have the legislative committee take another look at it for a, uh, a, support, a level of support. Do I understand correctly what you're asking? You understand correctly. Okay. Is that? Okay. Any further questions? Yeah, I, I have forgotten about the vagaries of, <laughs> of uh, the Senate. <laughs> so um, with that in consideration, I would uh, reword my motion to include uh, coming back and just reporting on the status of the bill as it goes through the committee. Councilor, oops, sorry. Well, that wouldn't be a rewording. That would be an amendment. So you can you can make an amendment to your main motion, or you can withdraw your original motion and make a new motion. Let me let me try an idea with you, uh, just just to see if this works for you. This bill is going to pass or not pass out of the Senate in the next let's say a couple of weeks. That why don't you recommend that as the bill moves, the legislative committee take another run at it and bring it back to the council with an affirmative rec with a recommendation. <coughs> Would that be okay? Yeah. So we will just then pass on on our legislative agenda as it stands and then we'll uh, make sure that staff keeps in touch with you and we, we track that bill and we can bring it back for further review at a later date when we see exactly what the bill looks like. Okay? Yes. Right. Okay, all those in favor of the, um, the oh, motion on the floor is still the right. motion that was previously made? Oh, yes, you presiding all, if, motion? if you I would want... I will withdraw my motion. Okay. Well, the alternative would be for the presiding officer to make his motion, his proposal as a substitute motion. Okay. S I move we accept the uh, recommendation of the Legislative Committee. Second. Okay. Further discussion? All those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Good. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Nanke, 4.3 aye. Do we have a public hearing? We do. Yes, we do. We do. I'm sorry. Okay. We'll uh, go to public hearings. <laughs> <laughs> the recorder would read the title. The Salem City Council will now hold a public hearing for the purpose of considering a city-initiated vacation of public right-of-way for a portion of Fisher Road Northeast, north of Market Street Northeast. The area proposed for vacation is the southern portion of Fisher Road Northeast from the start of the future curve to its terminus north of Market Street Northeast. The proposed vacation contains approximately 0.41 acres of land. The criteria that are applicable to the decision are ORS 271.120, the Salem Area Comprehensive Plan, Article 4, Section J1, Transportation, the Salem Transportation System Plan, Street System Element, Policy 2.10, and SRC 76.140. Failure to raise an issue in the hearing in person or by letter, or failure to provide statements or evidence sufficient to afford the decision maker and the parties an opportunity to respond to the issue precludes an appeal to the Land Use Board of Appeals on that issue. A similar failure to raise constitutional issues relating to proposed conditions of approval precludes an action for damages in circuit court. Any participant may request an opportunity to present additional evidence, arguments, or testimony regarding the application. The City Council shall grant such requests by continuing the public hearing or leaving the record open for additional written evidence, arguments, or testimony. And there is a staff report. Mark Bechtel. There is. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem. Sorry. <laughs> what do you want? <laughs> oh, I just wonder if you want me to proceed or not. Yes, oh, please. <laughs> Good evening, uh, Council President Bennett and members of Council. My name is Mark Bechtel. I'm the Parks and Transportation Services Manager for Salem Public Works. And the issue we bring before you tonight for public hearing is a request for a city-initiated vacation of right-of-way for a portion of Fisher Road Northeast 
north of Market Street, northeast. As you can see on the map up in the screen, uh, Fisher Road uh, comes, it's a north-south street that comes parallel to Interstate 5, just north of Market Street. Uh, this is the Fred Meyer here. Uh, prior to the reconstruction of I-5, uh, Fisher Road connected to Market Street directly with the reconstruction of the interchange. Uh, it was left as a cul-de-sac. Uh, Fisher Road Northeast is classified as a collector street in the Salem Transportation System Plan and is not best served to remain a cul-de-sac at this area. So in 2001, the Salem Transportation System Plan was amended uh, to have a new alignment where Fisher Road would eventually co go to the east and then connect at the signalized intersection directly opposite of the main entrance to Fred Meyer. KSD Properties LLC and KSD Investments LLC own the properties on both sides of the uh, remaining portion of the cul-de-sac uh, and they, uh, their intent is to develop those properties in time uh, there is an improvement agreement that was uh, agreed with the city and in 2007 that agreement was uh, signed and the city uh, agreed to an intent to bring forward an initiated uh, vacation request. On August 9, 2010, council initiated the vacation request and it is before you tonight for public hearing. The amount area of the right-of-way that is uh, proposed for vacation is 0.41 acres. Uh, all the utilities have been notified of these proceedings. Utilities currently located within the right-of-way include Northwest Natural Gas and City Stormwater, Sanitary Sewer, and Water. As a condition of approving this vacation, staff recommends reserving a public utility easement for repair and replacement of existing utilities. The existing fire hydrant located on the area proposed for vacation is no longer needed since a new hydrant was provided as part of realigning Fisher Road Northeast. Additional requirements for fire service will be addressed through the development process. And I would add that if you drive by there today, you'll notice that a portion of this street realignment has already been constructed. The uh, Planning Commission uh, reviewed this proposed vacation on February 15, 2011, and supported staff recommendation unanimously for the vacation request. In your staff report, you will see the criteria for vacation uh, as as uh, set forth in the Salem Transportation System Plan, staff recommends that uh, those criteria have been met uh, and therefore staff recommends that council approve vacation of the right of way for a portion of Fisher Road Northeast north of Market Street as shown in your attachment one with a condition to reserve a public utility easement for repair and replacement of existing utilities and that required fire flows and available number of fire hydrants for existing and future structures be provided through the development process. Thank you. Any questions? Okay. Uh, we have one uh, member of the public, Bill Lule. Signed up. Good evening. I'm Bill Lule, uh, North City on Paving, uh, address is PO Box 516, State and Oregon. I'm the engineer and the surveyor on the project, as well as we did the construction of the project uh, without having the screen up there. The portion to the east has already been dedicated uh, to the public as well as the public utility easements and in working with the city on this is agreed upon that the owner dedicate the right of way and put the improvement in which has been done and in exchange the city would vacate the um, cul-de-sac there. So sort of they wanted to realign for their master plan um, uh, transportation plan in exchange they would vacate the uh, cul-de-sac uh, without any further ado, I'd be glad to answer any questions, but I just wanted to clarify if you had any questions in regards to this. Any questions for Mr. Lule? Thank you. I have a question regarding the residential area because that is a residential street. Yes. What is the speed limit going to be like? That is up to the city. Uh, the owner would have nothing to do with that. Okay. We're just required to construct a collector street standard. Okay. Mr. Fernandez, can you? Uh, certainly. Uh, Councilor, we would probably post that at 25 miles an hour, which is the typical residential street okay. speed limit. Uh, the design is such that you wouldn't be able to go much faster than that, given the curves so and the, and the width. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Lule. Uh, 
Okay. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak to this item? Any questions for Mr. Bechtel? Mr. Claus? I just have a quick question, just because I'm curious about this. This is right next to where that the old roller skating rink was, right? I just that, remember. That's correct. I remember trying to get to that place once in college, and that was just <laughs> uh, beyond a nightmare. It's so I would love to see this move forward. How how close are we on the uh, properties further east of the KDS property? I, I don't even know where we're at with some of this. I wish I could get you right to the very property line, but basically, if they've uh, they've constructed the street pretty much just about right here. Uh, and here is the, the old Skate Palace building that you're referring to. And so, so there's this, the, the intervening area here will have to occur over time as development occurs and may or may not involve city participation. If, if I may, I, I'd just like to, to add to it. Uh, the property owner, the agreement that we have with him is that he had to do the, uh, the layout of the street, so the layout as you see it has been designed by his consultants. And he also acquired right of way, uh, the bank that's uh, on the north uh, northwest corner of the signal. He acquired that and remodeled it to allow more room for the, uh, uh, for the street to go through. Uh, what's left to acquire is the back side of the church parking lot, which is right about there. Uh, and then little little nips and tucks through that uh, apartment complex. The most difficult acquisition would be that that property there. That's where we have some impacts. So uh, uh, we are actively working to see if we can find funding for that. It's a very important project to just be able to get folks through. ODOT really did the city a disservice. They did a great job of redoing the interchange. Uh, but they did a terrible right. disservice in cutting that off for uh, getting getting across town. So, so we've been working on it for a while. It just uh, all that remains really is funding okay. to get our part done. Okay. Councilor Dickey, would that also include the the signal intersection at Fred Meyer there, where I'm assuming that's where that street where it would come out there? Right. Um, because I was over there the other day, I went home and told my husband that is the worst intersection in Salem uh, by yes. far, worse than Mission Street if yes. you get stuck there. So you know if we're going to be routing Fisher Street traffic, um, you know through there, and I, a lot of people will be glad to have that connection. I think we will need to do something with the intersection, the signal. Uh, hopefully that would solve some of that. And you have no when you're in that part of town, you have no place else to go. You have to get all the way to Lancaster, and it just creates all kinds of issues. Now, uh, we are going to be improving uh, market at Lancaster. So that intersection will get wider, will uh, become better. So that should help the Fred Meyer intersection as well. But, but it's just a part of town with a lot of traffic and not a lot of uh, alternatives. So, so this really creates an alternative that we hope will further the, the cause to ease the congestion through there. One of, Mr. Fernandez, one of the comments that I run into from the Lansing Neighborhood Association regarding that particular area is along Market Street where you have that third lane that uh, comes off of the, essentially comes off the freeway heading east and then disappears into a body of traffic depending on the speed of the person in that lane. Mm -hmm. Will you be fixing that as part of this whole project? It's, it's not part of the Market Lancaster project. Uh, it, it theoretically could be part of that, but you know, ODOT sort of has control of that piece of it. That's, that's part of their merging, of, of their diverge out of their, out of their ramp. So that's, that's the way it was designed. Ultimately, we may need to consider just having that third lane run further, you know, perhaps to the, to the uh, Fred Meyer signal or, or beyond, but it's not a part of any of the projects we have here. Okay, thank you. Uh, any further questions or comments? Councillor Nick. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd just like to remind everyone of all the wonderful music that came out of skate palaces in the past. <laughs> <laughs> uh, think of your favorite. <laughs> Should we all just That's take a moment and remember? <laughs> <laughs> any further comments or questions? Okay, public, I'm going to declare the public here and closed. Councillor Thomas, this is your ward. Would you like to make a motion? I move staff recommendation. Second. Second by Nanke. Uh, any discussion? All those in favor of the motion, say aye. 
Aye. Aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion passed. Okay. Mr. Chair. Councilor Clem. Uh, folks, um, as I um, had discussed with you just briefly a minute ago, I think had signed up on the wrong page. And so it would, I'd make a motion to suspend the rules or amend the agenda um, to allow public comment that was uh, um, scheduled for later in the, uh, the agenda to be conducted at this time. I have, uh, I have two names of folks who, who clearly signed up under what appeared to them to be public comment, not noticing it was agenda item number 10 and are going to be spending the evening with us if we don't uh, give them an opportunity to have their say and leave. So all those in favor? Second. Thank you. Second it. Okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Okay. We'll go back to public comment on our agenda and call up uh, Derek Pastel. Well. I thank you. You bet. If you For your time. Name, name an address or neighborhood. <laughs> yes, my name is Derek Postel. Address 1465 Woodside Court Southeast. Um, that's, that's my name and address. Great. Um, first, I would like to just uh, give honor to my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and thanks to the city council members for hearing um, uh, what I have here tonight. City Council members, I stand here as a representative of the body of Christ. Many of the issues that, the, that face the neighborhoods in our cities have been addressed with secular solutions. We as the body of Christ have, become, have begun efforts to unite churches in our communities to come together as one in prayer to stand against the infirmities that are continuing to affect many lives in our neighborhoods. In February, these efforts were initiated a total of five churches of our city joined and stood together visibly in prayer in the Northgate neighborhood. These efforts have brought forth many positive praise reports, not only for, from the church members who joined together with the home church of that neighborhood, but most importantly from individuals who reside in the Northgate community. We've had reports taken by participants after the events were over from youth that reside in Northgate saying to us, thank you for bringing peace to my neighborhood. Thank you for being concerned about the everyday activities that go on in our neighborhood that seems to be in many ways unaddressed. We stand today convinced that whatever levels these problems that our neighborhoods face cannot be solved with the same level of solutions. The solutions must be from a higher level. Example, we know the many challenges that our children face in our city school system. Many of the solutions that have been put in place have not diverted the continued growth of gang activities in many of our communities. Many of the solutions that have not, have not addressed the fact that a continued effort to communicate the differences in cultures must be maintained for our youth or they will be led in ignorance to address these issues with ignorant, ignorant solutions themselves. We ask the churches in these various neighborhoods stand with you on coming up with consistent, productive alternatives to help with the restoration and rebuilding of these communities. We pray that our city councils begin to really readdress prayer in our schools. We not only believe, but we know that prayer can change the mentalities of our youth and our communities. Prayer changes things. Unity prayer meetings that we started take place every first Sunday at Salem Mission Church at 4308 Hill Road Street Southeast at 4 o'clock p.m. All are welcome. Please attend. We will, be con we will continue that same week with the open prayer meeting and the locations of those events will be announced during the unity prayer meeting uh, at Salem Mission Church. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. Eric Thomas. Uh, I'm going 
good evening, chairpersons, um, city council members. Um, listening to my brother, you know, and listening to um, her earlier about consciousness. Um, what I'm doing, I'm a founder, I'm founding up a HOPE, uh, um, an organization called HOPE. And what HOPE is, it's uh, an outlet for, for young men. Because I feel that if we reach our young men, then we're, we're, we're able to change our community in some ways. Um, this conference is going to be held on March the 19th at Salem First Baptist Church. And um, I have some information here for anyone that might want to be participants with this, uh, with this uh, mission that we have. Because we have, to, we have to start being conscious of our young men because a lot of, a lot of them are going to gangs, going to drugs, and a whole lot of other things that are keeping them from being successful in our society. And I was thinking the other morning about how Salem wants to um, build up its economy. But if we can't build up our young men and make them love where they live, then they, when they get out of school, or if they even get out of school, they're going to disappear from here. None of their ideals will be able to take effect here because they don't like where they are. I asked a young man the other day, because I'm, I'm getting ready to start up a web page, um, what would you think, what do you think that I would like to put on, what would you as a young man like for me to put on this web page as a resource for you? And he said, you know, we have nothing to do here in Salem. See, a lot of the kids can't afford some of the things that's available here. So the next thing they have is to turn to gangs, drugs, or whatever. So we need to, as a city, try to find some type of resources for these young men. Because if not, we're going to lose them and we're going to lose the, the peace and the serenity of our community. Because it's going to turn into a gangland. I mean, this is, this is going to happen. So I, I pray that um, city council, chairpersons, um, that you come aboard with this. Because we need to help our young men. Thank you. Thank you, and, and the date, time, and place of hope? Um, March the 19th at Salem First. Can I approach? I mean, sure. You might say it into the microphone or it <laughs> loses all the effect. Okay, great. And we didn't get a, uh, a name and word just for the record as well. Oh, we didn't. I'm sorry. Eric, could you do your name and uh, ward again? My name is Eric Thomas. My ward is Ward 6. <laughs> That's an interesting My beautiful wife. <laughs> but I mean, you know, all seriousness, um, this, is, this is going to be an issue and we really do need to address it. You know, this webpage is going to have resources for young men as far as education. I'm looking for mentors. You know, because, you know, some of you guys are very distinguished gentlemen. And, and, and a young man would be very pleased to have someone to just lead him in the right direction. Because I know sometimes in my life, if I have had someone to, to show me the right way, some things might not have happened in my life, you know? But I just pray that you guys um, help me out. Contact information right now. Excellent. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. Councillor Nanke. Going back to uh, 4.3i. Correct. I would move staff recommendation. Second. Second, Second um, by uh, Tesler. And uh, Mr. Chair, encourage the, uh, the pulling of this item uh, to <coughs> regards to uh, openings on the Salem Planning Commission and the uh, Salem Citizen Budget Committee. We have an opening for <coughs> Budget Committee for a resident of West Salem. Uh, Ward 8, um, and we have an opening for Salem Planning Commission, which is not ward based, so it can be anyone. And actually, if I recall, this is the uh, position that it would allow someone outside of the city limits but within the urban growth boundary uh, to serve on the, the Planning Commission as well. Those um, applications need to be in by March 11th, um, and the council will actually make a decision on April 4th. So again, if you're interested in serving on Planning Commission, you can live anywhere within the Salem, Ke Salem Kaiser Gosh. Urban Growth Boundary. Um, or if you live in West Salem and want to come talk with budget people, um, since that's going to be 
a fantastic budget committee season this year as well. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, just wanted to put that in. Chances and like this don't come along. They right? don't. And uh, I, I know a lot of people um, have turned in applications in the past. It, it's really hard to time them when we have openings. So we wanted to make a special effort to let people know that these positions were open and you need to get your application in by March 11th. Okay. Thank you. Any further discussion? All those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion passed. Okay, that brings us to information reports. Any questions on the information reports? Okay. We have completed our public hearings. That brings us to first reading of ordinances. Right. Ordinance Bill number 1311 relating to public art, amending SRC 15.0. 010, 020, 030, 050, 080, 090, and 100. Mr. Chair, I would uh, move that staff advance ordinance bill number 13 11, the second reading. Second. Seconded by Tesler. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Okay, it's advanced to second reading. And we will now start second reading of ordinance bills. And uh, we will be reading each of these and voting on each of these. So we won't be taking a long break here, but okay. Okay, go as quickly as I can. Okay. Ordinance Bill number 111, declaring and proclaiming certain territory located north of Center Street Northeast and west of Cordon Road Northeast, 4963 Center Street Northeast, annexed to the City of Salem, prescribing zoning and withdrawing the territory from Marion County Fire District number one. Councilor Bennett. Aye. Councillor Tesler? Aye. Councillor Nanke? Aye. Councillor Clausen? Aye. Councillor Dickey? Aye. Councillor Thomas? Aye. Councillor Cannon is absent. Councillor Clem? Aye. Mayor Peterson is absent. Ordinance Bill 211, declaring and proclaiming certain territory located at 4405 Remington Place Northeast Private Way, annexed to the City of Salem, prescribing zoning and withdrawing the territory from the East Salem Service District in Marion County Fire District Number 1. Councillor Bennett? Aye. Councillor Tesler? Aye. Councillor Nanke? Aye. Councillor Clausen? Aye. Councillor Dickey? Yes. Councillor Thomas? Aye. Councillor Cannon is absent. Councillor Clem? Councillor Clem? Aye. Mayor Peterson is absent. Ordinance Bill 311, declaring and proclaiming certain territory located at 4612 Portland Road Northeast, annexed to the City of Salem, prescribing zoning and withdrawing the territory from the East Salem Service District, Marion County Fire District Number 1. Councillor Bennett? Aye. Councillor Tesler? Aye. Councillor Nanke? Aye. Councillor Clausen? Aye. Councillor Dickey? Aye. Councillor Thomas? Aye. Councillor Cannon is absent. Councillor Clem? Aye. Mayor Peterson is absent. Ordinance Bill 411, de declaring and proclaiming certain territory located south of Kubler Boulevard Southeast, east of 27th Avenue Southeast, and south of Foxhaven Drive Southeast area, annexed to the City of Salem, prescribing zoning and withdrawing the territory from the Salem Suburban Rural Fire Protection District. Councilor Bennett? Aye. Councilor Tesler? Aye. Councilor Nanke? Aye. Councilor Clausen? Aye. Councilor Dickey? Aye. Councilor Thomas? Aye. Councilor Cannon is absent. Councilor Clem? Aye. Mayor Peterson is absent. Ordinance Bill 511, declaring and proclaiming certain territory located north of State Street, northeast, west of Cordon Road, northeast, and south of Auburn Road, northeast area, 4900 block of State Street, annexed to the City of Salem, prescribing zoning and withdrawing the territory from the East Salem Service District and Marion County Fire District Number 1. Councillor Bennett? Aye. Councillor Tesler? Aye. Councillor Nanke? Aye. Councillor Clausen? Aye. Councillor Dickey? Aye. Councillor Thomas? Aye. Councillor Cannon is absent. Councillor Clem? Aye. Mayor Peterson is absent. Ordinance Bill number 611, declaring or proclaiming certain territory located south of Boone Road Southeast, west of 36th Avenue Southeast and east of the Interstate 5 Bypass area, annexed to the City of Salem, prescribing zoning and withdrawing the territory from the Turner Rural, Rural Fire Protection District. Councillor Bennett? Aye. Councillor Tesler? Aye. Councillor Nanke? Aye. Councillor Clausen? Aye. Councillor Dickey? Aye. Councillor Thomas? Aye. Councillor Cannon is absent. Councillor Clem? Aye. Mayor Peterson is absent. Ordinance Bill 711, declaring and proclaiming certain territory located south of Brush College Road Northwest, north of Morrow Court Northwest area, 2500 block of Brush College Road Northwest, annexed to the City of Salem, prescribing zoning and withdrawing the territory from the Salem Sub Sub Suburban Rural Fire Protection District. 
Councillor Bennett? Aye. Tess Councillor Tesler? Aye. Councillor Nanke? Aye. Councillor Claussen? Aye. Councillor Dickey? Aye. Councillor Thomas? Aye. Councillor Cannon is absent. Councillor Clem? Aye. Mayor Peterson is absent. Ordinance Bill 811, declaring and proclaiming certain territory located at 4560 Center Street Northeast, annexed to the City of Salem, prescribing zoning and withdrawing the territory from the East Salem Service District, Marion County Fire District Number 1, and the suburb Suburban East Salem Water District. Councillor Bennett? Aye. Councillor Tesler? Aye. Councillor Nanke? Aye. Councillor Clausen? Aye. Councillor Dickey? Aye. Councillor Thomas? Aye. Councillor Cannon is absent. Councillor Clem? Aye. Mayor Peterson is absent. Ordinance Bill 911, declaring and proclaiming certain territory located at 4405 Cordon Road Northeast, annexed to the City of Salem, prescribing zoning and withdrawing the territory from Marion County Fire District Number 1. Councillor Bennett? Aye. Councillor Tesler? Aye. Councillor Nanke? Aye. Councillor Claussen? Aye. Councillor Dickey? Aye. Councillor Thomas? Aye. Councillor Cannon is absent. Councillor Clem? Aye. Mayor Peterson is absent. Ordinance Bill 1011, declaring and proclaiming certain territory located at the 1100 block of Hoffman Road, Northeast area, annexed to the City of Salem, prescribing zoning and withdrawing the territory from the East Salem Service District and Marion County Fire District Number 1. Councillor Bennett? Aye. Councillor Tesler? Aye. Councillor Nanke? Aye. Councillor Claussen? Aye. Councillor Dickey? Aye. Councillor Thomas? Aye. Councillor Cannon is absent. Councillor Clem? Aye. Mayor Peterson is absent. Ordinance Bill 1111, declaring and proclaiming certain territory located at the 2200 through 2700 block of Michigan City Lane Northwest right of way, annexed to the City of Salem and prescribing zoning and providing the territory primary fire protection and EMS service from fire station number 11 and secondarily from fire station number 5. Councillor Bennett? Aye. Councillor Tesler? Aye. Councillor Nanke? Aye. Councillor Claussen? Aye. Councillor Dickey? Aye. Councillor Thomas? Aye. Councillor Cannon is absent. <laughs> Councillor Clem? Aye. Mayor Peterson is absent. Ordinance Bill 1211, declaring and proclaiming certain territory located west and east of Fisher Road Northeast and south of Ward Drive, 4195 Fisher Road Northeast, annexed to the City of Salem, prescribing zoning and withdrawing the territory from the East Salem Service District and Marion County Fire District Number 1. Councillor Bennett? Aye. Councillor Tesler? Aye. Councillor Nanke? Aye. Councillor Claussen? Aye. Councillor Dickey? Aye. Councillor Thomas? Aye. Councillor Cannon is absent. Councillor Clem? Aye. Mayor Peterson is absent. Uh, it just becomes a model road. Um, no new bit. Uh, yeah, we have no mayor's items. Uh, councilor item. Councilor Clam. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I move that City Council identify Eola Ridge Neighborhood Park as the next West Salem Park for development in the next budget capital improvements program. Second by Nanke. Thank you for the uh, second. Uh, I'd, I'd ask uh, Director Fernandez to explain the process that we're going through, and that's the intent of my motion. Yes, thank you, Councillor Clem. And once again, I apologize uh, to the council and to Councillor Clem. I sent out a, uh, a clarification item on uh, on this one as well, and it was, I guess I typed in the wrong address. Um, uh, <laughs> the Councillor item that uh, Councillor Clem has brought forward is it was really done at the request of the staff uh, in the CIP there is uh, there were two parks mentioned one is Kale Road Park which we're moving forward on and the other item in the CIP calls for a park to be developed in West Salem uh, but it was to be determined uh, staff has been working to identify a park we've actually been in discussions with the West Salem Neighborhood Association uh, everyone has agreed in, in West Salem that Eola Ridge is the right park so we made the request of uh, Councilor Clem if he agreed that Eola Ridge was the right one to bring that forward as a Councilor Island. So that item, so that's where that is coming from. Uh, if approved by Council, we will uh, put it in our uh, in our construction budget to bring it forward as a uh, pre-development effort, similar to what we're doing at uh, at Kale Road Park. Any comments? Yeah, I just want to add that um, this um, this this park, which has a neat sign from the city of Salem. Um, park to soon be constructed. The sign is 14 years old. Um, there's 300, 500, almost 500 homes all within walking distance of this. It's clearly, the, it was situated to be a neighborhood park and um, as we had prioritized Kale Road um, a year ago or two years ago, 
Um, at that time, we just sort of identified a West Salem Park. Um, so my motion is to simply continue that discussion that we had previously. But you know, when we can get funding, uh, this park already has a master plan, so it would it would be the only West Salem Park that would be eligible. So there were four other sites, and the neighborhood association took a couple of meetings, um, as well as with the parks chair to determine that Eola Ridge was probably the one that citizens deserved to see the next. Um, Eola Drive as a part of the Streets and Bridges bond measure was passed and uh, the idea also is potentially if funding were identified the park construction could coincide with the street improvement. So appreciate your support uh, in this motion. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor Tesler. Thank you. I don't have any problem with this park or the location or the <coughs> need for it, and I think all of that is recommended. However, I do have the opportunity to do business with other cities, and um, other cities usually do not construct or build out a park unless the budget includes operation and maintenance funding. And I really think that in the future we should really think about that when we approve new parks, because it's really it's nice to approve a new park, but it doesn't do any good if we can't take care of it. And that's the problem we have, is that we can build a very nice new park, but we don't have the money to take care of it or empty the trash or do the things that need to be done in the park. And so I would ask my fellow counselors to ruminate upon this and uh, you know, really think about this in the future when we look at these projects, because if they don't have operations and maintenance tied to them now, they're probably not going to have it later. And that's going to be a problem because it'll be budget time and this park will come forward and all with all the other parks and then we'll be fighting about who's going to empty the trash and how we can pay for these essential services. So I would just ask everyone to just kind of tuck that away in the back of their mind when we go through budget process. And I'm the last person to stand in the way of a park, but our money situation demands it. And Ms. Hagelin. Oh on the subject but first of all I wanted to say thank you for the opportunity to be here tonight and also wanted to um, as a the vice chair of the Chris and Illahi Neighborhood Association want to let you know um, and to the staff that's remaining what a wonderful job they do um, in supporting us it's uh, for limited resources the amount of time that um, you provide and the information and all those repeat visits mark um, we it's very very helpful um, but to the issue at hand I'm also active in a group called Friends of Nelson Park which is a 30 year old park out in South Salem about 10 acres and it's a struggle the equipment um, it's just being pulled out by the city because there's no money to fix it um, so there is a definite issue and it's left to the citizens to uh, maintain and actually do the repair and finding those monies to do that. The city does a wonderful job of, you know, bootstrapping the things together, but big picture, um, it's going to take more than that. So if there's any money left over for this park. <laughs> yes. There'll be a line, right? <laughs> yeah. Yes, Councilor. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just uh, to let folks know as well, there is a group meeting to look at you know, funding for parks and, and operation and maintenance and what have you that Councillor Dickey is chairing. Um, and hopefully some good will come from that. Uh, we'll find some special uh, pot of money or come up with some ideas that can actually help out on that because it is an issue and I know that we had um, one of, I think it was in Councillor Thomas's ward where we torn down uh, all the play equipment. McKay uh, Park. Yep. Yeah, and yeah. it was like, how long do you wait before you turn it back from a field to a, a playground? Yeah. So that's always tough. Thank you. Councillor Tesser, did you have your hand up? Oh, I just wanted to respond to uh, guest Councillor Hagland's um, comment, and I'm sorry I didn't welcome you earlier. Uh, I, I just, you know, it's important to note that the park services that we provide are just the bare sketch minimum essentials and sometimes I know that as a city we can't do this but sometimes I just kind of wish that we could just kind of let things decay to the level where they would be if we could not provide bare services because people would enormously notice the difference I mean we have a park that's bigger than Central Park within the city limit and imagine how hard that is to take care of such a big piece of property and we have so many parks 
but I just remain very, very concerned about the future of parks because I think it's great to allocate new parks and set them aside, but we have to think about how we're going to take care of them. And if we're just at the bare minimum right now, where are we going to be with the addition of new parks? And I'm not saying that West Salem doesn't need a new park, nor Kale Road, neither, but I'm just saying just think about this question because it has not been the policy of this body to require that we have operation maintenance money when we forward parks this before. Councillor Clem. Yeah, uh, thank you. I appreciate the comments. Um, I just want to reiterate, I think this council has supported yeah. at least uh, let the charge to add or keep the four parks positions in the budget just for exactly what to um, uh, so the concerns that, that you comment on. And I would um, endeavor to continue that level of support mm -hmm. for our parks because whether you've got the money for the toys or the development or the amenities, you, at the bare bones, you have to have the staff to, to even care and con be concerned about the park. Uh, use of inmate labor for maintenance doesn't happen unless there's a staff person assigned to that park. So um, within the last year, we took a big, um, we took a lot of heat for funding those additional four parks positions, and I'll continue to do that because your, your concern is a valid one. I'm anxious to see what the uh, Parks Master Plan Task Force comes up with. Um, I think the community does want to do a better job of, of seeing us take care of our parks better than we have. Thank you. Uh, any further comment, questions? All those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 All opposed, nay. Motion passes. And if there's nothing else, we're adjourned. Da, da, da.